This week's message, given by Pastor Stephen Yoon at the Second Sunday United Methodist Church, April 19, 2020. The message is Defogging the Window of Faith, based on John 20, 19-31. Good morning, Second Sunday United Methodist Church. The scripture reading for today is found in John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. It was late that Sunday evening, and the disciples were gathered together behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities. Then Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said. After saying this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were filled with joy at seeing the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. Thomas said to them, Unless I see the scars of the nails in his hands and put my finger on those scars and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were together again indoors, and Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Then reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop your doubting and believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to Thomas, Do you believe because you see me? How happy are those who believe without seeing me. In his disciples' presence, Jesus performed many other miracles which are not written down in this book. But these have been written in order that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through your faith in him, you may have life. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you join me as I pray? Oh God, may the the words of my mouth the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. As we listen to your word, help us to see the risen Christ among us. Help us to see that you are walking closely with us during these challenging times. Open our hearts and minds so that we could better understand your word and live out your word in our everyday life. We pray pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our faith is like a glass window or car windshield, if you like. You know, window welcomes light coming down from the sun. It gives you the vision to to see outside. It helps you to see things even when the wind and rain impede your vision. It doesn't mean, though, that your car is immune to harsh winter cold or snow. It doesn't mean that your car will stop strong winds from blowing or prevent the rain from pouring down either. You still have to face them, but like a glass windshield does, your faith helps you to see through them and put you in perspective. Even if things get screwed up and we lost the normal part of yesterday, our faith gives us hope that there is still a tomorrow coming. But when we speak of faith as Christians, we don't mean certainty. It doesn't mean we've gained absolutes. 
As I mentioned before, faith is actually far from an attitude of certitude, which refers to a mindset that we know things perfectly and we own the truth, the absolute truth. As Christians, we are the ones who follow Jesus Christ, who is the life, the way, and the truth. We don't possess the truth. We follow the truth. For Christian disciples, faith is about having an attitude of exploration, which is a mindset that what we know and experience is always partial and incomplete. Like Paul talks about seeing only a reflection as in a mirror. This is why our Christian faith has been recognized as faith-seeking understanding. It is a faith that continues to seek further and deeper understanding and knowledge of God. Oftentimes, our faith journey is like driving a car in a foggy weather. Ambiguity and uncertainty are deeply embedded in our world, especially in our world of brokenness. We all have an uneasy sense hidden deep in our souls that we are vulnerable and frail creatures. And a life crisis or tragedy makes that uneasy truth even more visible and real to us. Embracing ambiguity and uncertainty as part of our faith journey is therefore not just an option, but, a, but an ethical, spiritual mandate because it's deep, it is deeply rooted in our life, whether we acknowledge it or not. Certainly, we humans find a sense of comfort in absolutes, certainty. We find a sense of belief in orders. We find uncertain, ambiguous situation threatening rather than promising. Especially in times of crisis, we long for certainty and security even more desperately. And when our search for certainty is driven by fear and anxiety, we are likely to become more intolerant of ambiguity we are facing in life. It's like battling foggy windshield in your car while you are driving. Juggling with ambiguity and uncertainty in our life and faith could lead us to at least three different paths or responses. Interestingly, they all begin with alphabet D. It could lead us to disbelief, doubt, or deeper faith. I will explain what I mean by each. But no matter where you find yourself now, here is the gospel, my friends. When the disciples were still trying to figure out their faith and life, Jesus came to them, even Though the lock, even through the locked doors, and he clear up the foggy window of their faith. Juggling with ambiguity, uncertainty, as I mentioned, could lead us to disbelief, which is a determined refusal to believe. Facing the uncertain future, some people say, "I'm not gonna believe." in anyone or anything except myself. If God does exist, if Easter is really true, this tragedy, this crisis should never happen. Of course, this belief is on a continuum, takes many forms. Some are more open than others. Another form of disbelief goes like this. I'm not going to believe until I see or touch or experience such and such. Sounds familiar? This morning we read the story of the recent Christ who came to his disciples, especially to the Thomas. Many Christians remember Thomas as a doubter, but technically, technically speaking, he wasn't a doubter. At that moment, he was more of a person with disbelief because he refused to believe the resurrection. When the disciples told him that they had seen the Lord, Thomas said to them, Unless I see in his hands a mark of nails and place my finger into his side, 
I will never believe. Do any of you remember what I preached on Easter Sunday last year? Don't worry, I didn't remember it either. I preached about the greatest comeback in sport history. I talked about the greatest comeback in NFL history. The game between the Bills and Oilers. Does it uh, ring a bell to you now? The hometown Bills were behind. The score was 35, 35 to 3. It looked as if all hope was lost. Plus, the weather was nasty. It was a cold, windy day in suburban Buffalo. So many fans simply chose to go home early. But what happened after they had left was unbelievable. The final, the Bill overcame 32-point deficit to defeat Oilers in, in overtime. The final score was 41-38. to 38. The game was not televised locally. Many fans of the Bills didn't realize until much later that the Bill came back to win. Thomas was like those fans who were not in the stadium and missed one of the greatest comebacks in history. Of course, in the room there were at least ten witnesses, his fellow uh, disciples of Jesus, but he refused to believe. He wasn't doubting because he never believed in resurrection. He was disbelieving. But his disbelief had a purpose. He wanted to know the truth. He wanted the physical presence of Jesus, but Thomas didn't absolutize or idolize his disbelief, but opened himself when given reason to do so. I don't know if you have ever wished to see and experience the physical presence of Jesus in your life. But when things are uncertain, ambiguous, we feel anxious. We do. We want something tangible, something we can see and touch, and something we can hold on to. Sometimes it could lead us to idolizing something or someone that is not God. But friends, during this anxious time, what are you holding on to? Where do you find a sense of comfort and certainty these days? To be quite honest, there are times that I would feel a good deal more confident in, in my faith if I were able to have Jesus stand in front of me and I, I to, could see him and touch him and hear him directly. But that may be the very reason why this story is included in the scripture, to see the reality of what it is to believe. Again, the words of Jesus remind us, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed him and his resurrection. Second, juggling with ambiguity and uncertainty could lead us to doubt. Doubt is different from unbelief or disbelief. That you doubt something means you already accepted something as part of your belief. Doubt is therefore not the absence of faith, but the questioning of faith, because you can only doubt what you already believe. In other words, doubt presupposes some kind of faith, belief, and it is one of the most common struggles in the Christian life. There was a man who was going through a very intense struggle in his life. He had been forced to deal with his guilt over the ways in which he had perpetuated his life values and idol, ideals, and broken his deepest commitment. One day he had seen to his counselor, after listening to this man, you know, describe his struggle with guilt and pain, the counselor says to him, do you go to church? Yes, the man replied, nearly every Sunday, most, most all my life. Did you go to on uh, Easter? The counselor asked. Yes, of course, the man answered. After a moment of silence, the counselor said to the man, Well, I don't know why you keep going. It certainly isn't doing you any good. Surprised by the counselor's words, the man asked what he meant. The counselor replied, If you really believe that Jesus 
died on the cross for you, you wouldn't go on acting as if you have to carry the cross yourself. If you actually believe that Jesus died and rose again to forgive you, you would find the way to forgive yourself. Whether we notice or not, believing in something has implications for our life. If you were questioning whether the truth of Jesus' death and resurrection could make any real connection with your life, you may be in the place of Thomas. It's a disguised form of doubt. I don't know about you, but as this pandemic continues in our society, a sense of ambiguity and uncertainty increases in my heart, in my mind. Sometimes I realize that the window of my faith gets blurry and foggy. I find myself asking these questions more frequently. Could my life, our church, our society go back to normal? Could the power of resurrection really overcome the reality we are currently battling with? Am I truly living in the power of resurrection during this challenging, anxious times? I ponder. We believe that what happened to Jesus on Easter morning is the central affirmation of the Christian faith. If God raised Jesus from death, what does the truth to do, do to us, my friends? If Easter is true, how does the truth shape and adjust our everyday lives? Sometimes we are not so sure about it. Again, we are reminded that Thomas is a great name, which means twin, though his twin never appears in Scripture. And some suggest that each of us is his twin. Like Thomas, each of us has our nagging doubts, disbeliefs, sometimes skepticism. If Thomas' disbelief is the most persistent, and then he is our twin brother. Because our doubts, disbelief, skepticism persist, and at times, insistent. As I mentioned in the beginning, if our faith is like a windshield, having disbelief or doubt in the fact of the resurrection, it's like a dealing with a foggy windshield constantly. The truth is that it never goes away completely. Especially when you drive in an extremely hot or cold weather. You have to keep battling foggy windshield. It makes the vision blurry, impedes your eyesight. Like foggy windshield, doubts and disbelief could come to us anytime for internal reasons, what's going on inside of us, or external reasons, what's going on in outside in our world or both, internal and external. But again, hear the good news. Jesus comes to us and clears up the foggy window of our faith. He leads us to deeper faith, which is the third path that I want to talk about. While we may find ourselves struggling with doubts and disbelief, embracing ambiguity and uncertainty can lead us to deeper and more mature faith. And it is only possible with the power of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus came to his disciples, he first said to them, Peace be with you. And then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. You know what's interesting about foggy windshield is that it could happen in both hot and cold weather, especially extreme weather. During cold winter, we use heater to stay warm in our car, which can result in fog on the inside of our car windshield. In warm, humid weather, turning on the air conditioning can cause the opposite result. It would create fog blurring your windows from the outside. Whether it's an internal or external, it is the cold or hot wind that can clear up the foggy windshield. As we know, wind is a good word to describe the power of the Holy Spirit as the Bible often portrays 
the movement of the Holy Spirit as a form of a strong wind. Change happens when winds blows. In the same way, when the Holy Spirit moves, she brings change like the wind does. Just as the wind can defog the windshield, the Holy Spirit has the power to defog the window of our faith. She helps us to turn our disbelief and doubt into a deeper faith. Holy Spirit teaches us that to live as a Christian means to live in the power of his resurrection. To know Christ in the power of his resurrection means that we begin to see things in a whole new way. We come to see our lives, ourselves, our relationships, and the world around us with a completely different frame. Remember my message from last Sunday? In the power of Jesus' resurrection, we are given a new frame, a new window. Through this new window, the new frame, we start seeing people the way Jesus sees them. We start loving people the way Jesus loves them. We start seeing the world around us the way Jesus would see. We trust God the way Jesus trusted the God he called Father. Friends, Easter is more than an intellectual acknowledgement that Jesus is risen from death. Easter is about seeing and living a whole new world, not just someday, but today, here and now. Of course, the whole new world is not completely here, not in its fullness. But our faith in risen Christ assures us that it is sure on the way. And our job is to wait. To put it in a Christian term, we hope. Just as the reason Christ came to his disciples, so the Holy Spirit comes to our hearts, our lives that might have been closed due to fear and despair. He sees us for who we are, where we are now. He sees the life you and I are living. and helps us to see and live Easter in our lives today. She helps us to continue trusting that God is active in our midst. When bad things happen, some people tend to see them as act of God. We humans tend to associate things that happen beyond our control with the act of God. When bad things occur, God, in fact, is active, but in a different ways. He's active in and through our questions, confusions, doubts, and even disbelief. God is active in and through our responses and actions. God is active in in and through the community. God is active in and through the people of faith, sustaining them, guiding them, healing them, redeeming them. So friends, keep the faith. Keep the faith in the resurrection of Jesus. Hold on. Continue to hope. On Holy Third Saturday last week, I uh, shared a song along with uh, Audrey's devotional. The title of the song was "Hold On," and I want to I want to uh, share with you the words of the song as I close my message this morning. It goes like this: If you feel today that you cannot make it. Keep holding on, because you can take it. If you hold on a little while longer, hold on a little while longer. Hold on a little while longer. Hold on. If you feel it's raining all in your life, and day by day there is nothing, nothing going right, just hold on a little while longer. Hold on. Hold on. You've got to hold on to his hand. God's unchanging hand. You gotta hold on to his hand, God's unchanging hand. You gotta build your hopes on things eternal. My God will never let you down. Weeping may endure for the night, but if you trust in Jesus, everything's gonna be all right. 
just to hold on a little while longer. Hold on a little while longer. Hold on a little while longer. Hold on, my friends. Amen.